Yeah, just, sorry, let's just keep like that. So uh, let's review um, what it means to measure the limits of the page cache uh, and things we could likely improve on the page cache. Um, so one of the outcomes of this thread is that it begs the question of what is normal um, and what is pathological. Um, the other thing too is like, why, why would you even do this? Um, well, you would do this if you wanna make sure that you're not regressing the page cache, right? So if you're making any changes to the page, page cache, you wanna keep people happy. Um, and in doing the work that we've done for LBS, we wanted to ensure that we're, we're not gonna make anyone angry by you know, introducing a performance regression. So we did, we did a quite a bit of performance tests to ensure that we weren't regressing the page cache, but then we had some other pathological test cases and this is one of the ones that came up uh, for discussion. So I will admit that some of the tests that we did were obviously pathological, but when you're testing the page cache, that's what it's about. You're testing normal uses and also pathological use cases. So it begs the question whether or not we should be doing this, if people are doing this, and then we had a, a series of outcomes from the, these discussions that are likely worth discussing here. Um, I think from what I gather, is Chris here? Chris Mason? No. no? Oh, okay, great. So I think that he had the most sensible definition of what I'd like to propose that maybe we evaluate and consider for a normal uh, workload. And that is to try to use, let's say, like a rate zero, six drives, and try to get parity for bio and, and direct IO. Does that seem sensible to folks? What sort of drives? That's a great question. Let's, let's go for flash, latest technology. Well, so Chris did the work. He, he already did the performance benchmarks that, on this, and he seemed to indicate that he didn't run into any performance regressions. You know, the, you do have parity. So the question that I would have is, do we want to keep upkeep that with direct I.O.? So yeah, I guess uh, can uh, Dave can. You, you, Keep going, all right. So I'm pretty sure Dave is mentioning no way in hell can we get parity with direct IO and buffered IO with RAID zero and six drives. Um, so that's, that's his point right now. If that's not the case, I mean, obviously, we, let's take the time here during the conference to evaluate whether or not we wanna strive for that. Um, then how about tools for testing? You know, um, I just learned actually about any uses uh, about eBPF cache set that Dave Allure had mentioned to me. Uh, there's PC stats too. I haven't used that as well either. Um, so the pathological test case was the one that got attention for some reason. Uh, it was the one that I mentioned, but I, I was just curious about this one question about whether or not the top uh, throughput numbers and the, the ones below for buffered IO, whether or not this is something that we're okay with, even if it is pathological. Um, and Jesus, holy sh Oh my God, all right, so, so it's basically 86 gigabytes per second uh, versus 7,000 megabits per second. Um, and that's just the F FIO thread. Sorry for the font issues here, I don't know what to do. Yeah, we, we already tried that. Um, yeah, it didn't work, it seems, sorry. I'll just put this, I'll, I'll, I'll just reply to that large thread and then, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, I'll try to read through this, but you know, it, this, it, things are already, it's not, nothing new that was not already on the thread. Um, so this is easy to read out. Um, one of the other outcomes of this thread also was that uh, Willie had pointed out a 64 random read uh, issue that we have, a performance, you know, bottleneck in, in a way. And Lynn has posted a patch uh, to uh, do an optimization for this. Kent tested it and uh, he indicated that there was a 25% improvement. Um, Linus was not happy yet with pushing this upstream, so I'm, I'm, I am testing it though, at least to see if it doesn't crash or, you know. But it's another type of corner case, a different type of workload. Um, so other things that came up in discussion were, Linus mentioned the pesky POSIX inode locking semantics. And 
Uh, Chinner had pointed out that the assumption is broken today on Linux anyway, and there's a slew of file systems that already don't guarantee that. Um, Kent already followed through with a patch to essentially remove the uh, inode lock for buffered writes for bcachefs. Um, and essentially what, what Kent then ended up doing was extending or appending, uh, taking the lock range instead, and when that doesn't succeed, you fall back to the inode lock. Um, so this can break POSIX, but the question that I would have here, I think that it would be great to reach consensus on is do we care? Um, it sounds like we're already not respecting that, and it sounds like people don't want that world anyway. So uh, it begs the question of what to do if we want a world where we are not following that. Um, there's some ideas out there that were thrown out in the mailing list. One of them was Amir's POSIX uh, Fed buys, um, and then Dave, you mentioned how maybe the atomic API is like really what we would want. And Yankara today mentioned to me that there's also some implicit things that we already do for this that's not part of the atomic API, but that already guarantees some sort of atomicity. I don't know if Yankara is here. Yep. So, the, yes, the that, observation yeah. that uh, is this on? Yeah, okay. The, the observation I'd make is that any time we're trying to make changes like this, it's always about trade-offs, right? You break a certain amount of safety, which you may or may not care about depending on the workload, for a certain amount of performance on micro benchmarks for which there may or may not be user space applications. And so it's really, really hard to answer these questions in the abstract, right? Because I don't know of any applications that actually need to do 64-byte random reads um, you know, at a very, very high rate, which care about that in terms of it actually affecting bottom line real-world applications. I also don't know if what, if anything, would break if we actually broke POSIX locking semantics, right? And so essentially, it takes work to make changes like this, and it takes work to prove that we're not going to actually make things worse, right? And so the question is, aside from people who like to show really, really cool micro benchmark results, like, I'm not sure what the justification is for, like, even investigating whether or not it's important, right? I mean. This is, you know, and again, this is a philosophical thing, right? So I was really, really interested in the torn rights thing because there were databases that could show a close to 100% performance improvement. Okay, now that's worth time to actually figure it out. So, But the in the absence of someone who cares about 64-byte rights at very high performance, like, is it worth it? There, there is someone who cares about exactly that. Yes, that, that, that is a real-world workload taken from a company who is willing to spend millions of dollars on hardware in order to accelerate that. Yes, that is real. Okay. Yeah. And for the record, when I posted the patches for this uh, mm -hmm. API, it was because of a real use case, and it wasn't even like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a corner case. It was just, um, just database uh, workload. Uh, over SMB, doesn't matter, but it, XFS was uh, three orders of uh, uh, <laughs> performance before, below XT4. It was very uh, significant um, and for no, for no re apparent reason, but of course there was a reason, but uh, yeah. it so wasn't reason relevant to the workload. I think your point is, is very valid, Ted, and um, I should also point out that my goal is not to make any changes here. <laughs> my goal really was to set out to only get a sense of what the limits are and let's make sure we don't break it, right? In that process, we have found some interesting questions to ask and this is what I brought here. And I think it raises also a few points that we likely should discuss. Uh, one of them is essentially the end of this, right? Uh, I think this is the end of the slides, maybe not. Okay, so this is now a separate session. Um, and so just look, look out for Paul's talk, which basically tries to address Kent's feedback. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, Dave, based on your experience, it doesn't seem like that's the issue here. Um, but we'll, 
you maybe yeah, can clarify. So, so uh, with your Buffett I.O. numbers there, that's 7,000... Sorry, can you, can you speak in, to, into That's on and I'm speaking into it, so... Uh, yeah. Swallow it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the numbers that you posted up front, you know, 86 gigabytes a second with direct I.O., 7 gigabytes a second with buffered I.O., you know, that's not unexpected. Um, and one of the big reasons for that is buffered I.O. has a, for a file system, has a single write-back thread. Okay, so, yeah, that's your problem. Yes. Um, and... Essentially, we end up with write back being CPU bound through that uh, single thread. And so we can't submit any more I.O. Uh, in write back. Uh, and so buffered I.O. can't go any faster than that. There's, depending on the, the, uh, the, the issues we have, one of the, if you go back, uh, you know, a few kernel releases before we switched on large folios for, for XFS, that write back, buffered IO write back limit was probably closer to two gigabytes a second um, because that workload would have thrashed the LRU lock like nothing else and that burnt all of the CPU on the write back thread. Um, and so what we're really seeing here with the, the buffer cache is not that, uh, oh, sorry, with the page cache and buffered IO is not that the page cache is slow. It's cleaning the page cache that is slow. And that's the thing that we need to focus on here when we talk about scaling the page cache. If you're just hitting the page cache, it will scale out to that 86 gigabytes a second. But the moment you have to actually do I.O., um, it will slow down very quickly. Um, and this is where you end up with the, the limitations. Now, there are hacks around it, as I've mentioned in the past, but what we really need to start looking at is, as it says up there, is we start to need looking towards mechanisms for parallelizing the page cache cleaning. And whether that be multiple write back threads, whether we use write through for these high bandwidth uh, type operations, uh, or use a different model altogether, um, the, the, fun, the fundamental fact is, is that the current architecture uh, for cleaning dirty pages does not scale beyond one CPU. And that's the thing that we need to fix. Do we, do we seem to have general agreement on that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying Dave's wrong in the slightest, um, but how we go about scaling it is, is a very interesting question because it kind of depends what kind of workloads we're talking about. If we're talking about having a single huge file and doing write back from multiple points in that file simultaneously, that is a much harder problem than uh, many medium or small size files. So we're, we're back to, well, what workloads do we really care about and why do we care about them? I'd argue that that's to an extent true, but even if we're talking about one large file, a lot of the CPU load is just scanning the page cache to get the files. Um, there are other issues, uh, for example, you know, in, these are file system specific issues. Delayed allocation requires a whole lot more uh, CPU in the write back code um, because it's running transactions and allocating file space. So if you're doing pure overwrites, the actual write back limits that you hit are higher and that's when you start to run into things like LRU lock contention um, where you have you know, the incoming write hitting the, the page cache, you then have memory reclaim hitting the page cache and then you have write back hitting the page cache and so we have five threads straight away for a single buffered I.O. that are all hitting the LRU lock. Um, and that's Another issue there is that at five threads all taking spin, the same spin lock, uh, that will basically bring a system to its knees at this point and the spin lock is the, the actual contention point. So even if we had more threads doing write back at that point to that one file, we're still hitting the same spin lock just on more CPU so it won't go any faster. So just adding concurrency isn't necessarily going to make things go any faster and in fact it may make things worse. 
Um, I actually tested the same exact workload by just adding the FIO uh, F-Sync and then Sync file range on every single write, and we hit a new wall. Um, so that confirms your statement, too. Yeah, so, so I mean, the, the, the obvious thing of just adding more write-back threads isn't necessarily going to do anything. Um, so one of the workloads that I frequently run is basic is it's basically an untar simulation, which is just uh, you know create a file, write 4K to it, close the file, um, and do that for as many files as you can as in you know say 32 parallel workloads, um, all in separate directories. So there's no contention for creating files or anything like that. Um, XFS gets stuck at about 50,000 files a second. Um, so we may be doing 200 megabytes a second at that case on a block device that can do easily seven to eight gigabytes a second. Um, and the limitation there is the single write back thread um, and doing all of the allocation and we can only run, do about 50,000 allocations a second through that single CPU. Um, that workload, however, would scale perfectly with multiple write-back threads because there's no actual contention between individual IOs and inodes and whatnot. And we can simulate that by adding, for example, a flush on close. So basically making it look like it's a write-through workload and suddenly that workload goes from 50,000 files a second to 600,000 files a second and it's now bound on the XFS journal in the create code. Um, which is a whole different problem. Um, but the point is, is that those particular workloads are significantly parallelizable and they will affect common everyday workloads on high performance storage, such as untarring large tireballs full of small files. Um, so when you start looking at what we need to do, it all comes down to how do we get the dirty data out of the page cache onto disk as efficiently as possible. We can get it into the page case quickly, we can overwrite into the page case really quickly. They're not the problem. It's getting the dirty data back to disk that we've got to fix. So given that it's synchronous right now, it's a single threaded, do we have anyone that has evaluated, you know, enhancing that? Is Because it, it doesn't sound like we, we reached an agreement that that's the path that we need to take immediately. Um, I have done some testing with essentially, for, you know, using the, the flush on close semantics to essentially clean, clean the data in the process context that, that wrote it. Um, and things like on just a standard NVMe SSD, a $200 consumer SSD, things like kernel compiles and git searches and untars and that sort of thing don't go any slower. Um, in some cases, they actually go quite a bit faster. Um, and that's essentially switching from right behind to near right through. So there is some data that, that I have that indicates that right behind is actually actively harmful on high performance, high, 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 high IOP rate uh, storage. Um, and I mean, I've gone, I've gone to the point with those things where um, even to the point of disabling inode caching, so we only cached entries, we don't cache inodes and so on, and the system doesn't actually go any slower. We're not gaining anything through having lots and lots of caching um, because the caches themselves are actually the limiting factor. Um, and we can do I.O. and low latency I.O. almost as fast or faster than we can get data out of the cache. Um, when the cache becomes a limiting factor. So there's, there's a few things there that you know, we need to look at and one of the things is that whether we actually do need to cache as much data on write as we actually do or leave it for a dirty for as long as we do before we actually write it back. Um, and that comes into, back into how do we get through beyond the single write back thread uh, limitation. Uh, so, so, so I guess this pretty much depends on, on the storage you have behind, yeah? because like for lower end storage, definitely the heavy caching we currently do is very beneficial. Yeah, 
but even like SATA grade SSDs, which do like 200 megabytes per second, there's still the advantage of dirty caching is significant. But uh, I like going for multiple write-back threads. In principle, we could do it, but uh, like it will take a significant amount of work because currently a lot of the write-back code is, especially like the handling of the ino dirty inode lists is very much dependent on the fact that there is only one thread that's ever operating on it. So uh, basically the whole logic of selecting inodes for write back and so on would have to be rewritten to work for multiple threads. I, it can be done, but it's mostly like research what's going to work if someone wants to go the direction. So. The, the inode queues, because I've looked at this, the inode queues and the dirty threads and so on, that's not so much of an issue. That's just a, you know, a mechanism of you know, a, you know, uh, uh, how we deal with the queue and how we fl empty the queue. The bigger problem is the tight integration into the control groups um, and things like write back estimation and how much we actually write back from each inode. So if we've got a bunch of large inodes, we actually do a uh, device bandwidth estimation to determine how much we write back from that inode before we switch to the next inode and write back from it so that we're not actually starving uh, the dirty inodes from write back because there's one large file that needs to be written back. Um, they're the complexities uh, in how to do that bandwidth estimation and breaking it up between multiple write-back queues um, in a way that doesn't starve any of the write-back queues or, you know, overly favour any one particular file. So they're the kind of complexities that I came across in just, mm -hmm. just breaking up or, you know, taking a, an inode off the, 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 the dirty queue and processing it. All we need to do is add a lock around that list and then we can just hand them off to, to, to work queues and so on and we can run them in parallel. It's the other things that... Yeah. Well, there are like subtle issues like you, you have, you like, for example, like file system, global file system sync is done using write back thread and that has to make sure it really sees all the inodes before it completes, yeah. And now when you have multiple write back threads that can be operating there, you have to be much more careful. So there are subtleties like this, like, of course, all can be solved, but yeah, I'm just saying it's not going to be trivial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, that's why I like the write through model rather than the multiple write back thread uh, model. Yeah, I mean, I suspect the bottom line is for a lot of this stuff, no one has bothered to benchmark or optimize this, maybe except for you, um, since, you know, I don't know how many generations of storage, right? Yeah. And the reality is, you know, for a developer who is, you know, unpacking a kernel tar tree and building it, you know, maybe we could make it 20% faster, but fast SSDs are so damn fast that we probably haven't noticed, it hasn't become a pain point for anyone, right? But, you know, maybe there is an opportunity to do something, especially if it's easy, right? Yeah. If it's just disable um, right back caching and just force right through, and we have some kind of heuristic so that we only do it for fast SSDs and we don't do it for USB thumb drives, yeah. you know, maybe that's easy. But, like, I'm not sure trying to do something really complicated well, with, Well, actually, you know. <laughs> on that point, Ted, yeah. too, on that write-through, if we do get to that, would that help with the buffered I.O. problem also for Atomics? Say again? With the write-through on the page cache, would that help with the Atomics problem that for buffered I.O.? Yes, it's the solution to the atomic I.O. because we know, you know, if we do write through, we know exactly the size of the atomic I.O. And as I said to Jens uh, earlier today when talking about that, we just take the pages out of the page cache, put the data in them, and then hand it to the direct I.O. code to do the atomic I.O. Write through and we're done. Yeah. So regarding that idea then, I, you know, Jens, you had some patches a long time ago um, it didn't seem like that was the correct approach because it didn't follow the, the direct I.O. lessons learned and so forth. Then Christoph had mentioned that he had a soft direct I.O. idea, but um, he's not here right now, so I'm not sure what the status of that is or if that's just an idea at this point. So it begs the question, what should we do for that? Yeah, so, 
Yeah, I'm not sure we want to go back to that topic, but when you were talking about write through, it would still be in the page cache, so it's still right. cached. It's yes. just that we're doing write through as opposed to, and instead of write back. Right, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah so, yeah, so essentially time. we put so it done. Just, just a heads up, we, we're out of time, so I don't know. To, maybe we can take this off in, in, a, in a buff or something? Yeah, sure. Write, you know, some page cache enhancements for write through. Talk about it tonight over a drink. Too. All right, beer, beer buff. So reads? Well, yeah, I mean, actually, I remember your thread specifically was for random reads. So beer buff tonight, great. Thank you. Thank you.